Eric would be introducing me in public, I wouldn't have fined him nearly so much money <laughs> for being tardy as I did way back when. Eric mentioned that my book is going to be required reading next year at Catholic High, and he described it as a kind of revenge. There's more to it than that. It's even sweeter than that, in that I'm going to make up all the tests that will be given. <laughs> I'm very grateful to the Clinton Center for inviting me and to Nikolai de Pippa in absentia, my uh, enthusiastic uh, backer, and I wish him a speedy recovery. The start of Catholic High School coincided with the collapse of another Catholic institution. And it's hard to imagine that the then Bishop of Little Rock, his name was John Morris, had the gumption to do what he did. In 1930, Little Rock College, which was a Catholic college, closed down as a result of the Depression. This was in May. At that time, the then Build, uh, St. John's Seminary buildings downtown at 25th and State Streets were being occupied by the seminarians who then moved out to what we all recognize as St. John's Seminary at 2500 North Tyre. In the meantime, with one Catholic school closing, Bishop Morris decided to open another, which is crazy, but he did it nonetheless, and so that's how Catholic High came to be at 25th and State Streets in 1930. The first graduating class had five seniors. Next year will be Catholic High's 80th anniversary, and we'll be at about 8,000 graduates by the time class of 2010 gets its diplomas. The school, when I was there, had about 200 students and a dozen teachers, all but two of whom were priests. Monsignor, then father, William Galvin, was the principal of Catholic High at that time. And we had a student body, as I said, of about 200. The present Catholic High has a student body of about 680. Next year, for the first time in its history, its tuition will be slightly over $3,000 a year, which compares very favorably with lots of other private schools. I have a friend in St. Louis who keeps me informed about St. Louis Catholic High School tuitions. There are many of them running at $12,000 or more a year. So uh, Catholic High is still something of a private school bargain. The present Catholic High has about 35 teachers. It's had that many for quite a long time. Half a dozen of whom are women, therefore not alumni. And about a dozen are Catholic High graduates. The school, when I was a freshman, as I said, was 90% of the faculty were priests. Monsignor Lawrence Frederick is now the only priest on the Catholic High faculty. Uh, he is a graduate of the class, I believe, of 55, so you can do the math as to Father Fred's age. And yet he's still teaching at Catholic High and St. Mary's, what essentially is a full schedule. Long may he teach. Brother Richard Sanker has been at Catholic High for more than a quarter of a century, and those are the two, shall we say, ecclesiastical figureheads at Catholic High School. All the rest of us are laymen and laymen. Now, 
I'm rarely ever stood up in front of a group of people and uh, batted my guns without having somebody or another stick a hand up in the air and want to know something or ask me a question. So that's what I invite you to do today. If you know that uh, something I've said isn't right, I'd be happy to be uh, informed of that. If you have a question about something I've said, just stick your hand up. There are people who will come to you within 3.2 seconds and your voice can be amplified and your question heard throughout the room. Uh, the one most common question doesn't need to be asked. No, this is not going to be on the test, what I'm about to tell you. My folks moved to Little Rock when I was eight. As I said in this book, I was a very unworldly kid. And speaking of this book, before I go any further, I should tell you that the two people most responsible for this book being in existence are here tonight. One is my pal since the third grade, Roger Armbrust who said to me, Mo, why don't you write a book about Catholic High? I said, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I have much to say. He said, well, have a go at it. Uh, a couple months later, I got in touch with him, and I said, well, I'm finished. <laughs> and he said, what took you so long? <laughs> uh, Rides then turned me over to his friend of many years, Ted Parkhurst, who is essentially the doctor who attended me throughout my uh, period of causing this thing to come to life, and he is the one who delivered this as manager of the Butler Center, which published the book. I might say by way of uh, new beginnings that Roger and Ted are embarked upon a new publishing program under the aegis of Parkhurst Brothers Publishing. They have already a half dozen exciting and new books that they have edited, that's Raj, and published, that's Ted, so I just thought I'd mention that. As I said, when I came to Little Rock, I didn't know much about it, never even heard of it, and uh, my parents uh, moved here because my dad had been transferred by Southwestern Bell so we came. My sister, heartbreakingly, was in her senior year of high school and just was dying to stay in Kirkwood, Missouri, where we lived. But as I said in the book, my mom said, the family is moving. So we all knew what that meant. My mother also famously got off a line to my sister Sue, who had the temerity to ask mom on Good Friday she could go to the movies, apparently with some pagan friends of hers. <laughs> and my mother, remembering the famous assassination that took place on Good Friday, said, you and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so soon backed off. heard anything about Catholic High not having grown up here, but my sister was a cheerleader for Catholic High, my sister Lucy. I didn't know exactly what that was either, but that's my first connection to Catholic High. I would like to read to you about my second clear memory about Catholic High, and that came when I was in about the sixth grade. One of my schoolmates asked, do you know what LSMFT stands for? Just about any kid, even one so out of touch as I, had that one covered. The American Tobacco Company's advertising had drummed it into just about everybody's head that the acronym stood for Lucky Strike Means Fine Tobacco. And so I confidently informed him. He said, that's not what it means. It means, Lord save me from tribute. <laughs> I was thus introduced to Tribu, Father Tribu that is. Clearly his reputation, even among grade schoolers, was scary. It wasn't exactly clear to me for what he should be feared. 
strikes me now as more than a bit ironic, five decades after hearing that warning for the first time about Father Tribu, that, so I have been told, similar ominous tales have been passed on about me by parochial school boys. I started at Catholic High School on the day after Labor Day in 1957. Looks like there are a few people in this room who might remember starting school the day after Labor Day, <clears throat> instead of in the middle of the summer, as now we do. <clears throat> Catholic High in those days had a, an initiation that took place for freshmen. Uh, some people like me were lucky enough to have a senior who was either blasé about the idea or had no particularly vicious tendencies. Uh, as a matter of fact, I have written a note to that senior just within the last few weeks. His name is John Robinson and he lives in Texas. And I said, thank you for being so nice to me during initiation week. Let me read to you about some of my fellows who weren't so lucky. I recall seeing some of my classmates down on all fours using their noses to push the proverbial peanut across the CHS playground, a clay-colored, dust-ridden hard pan. The seniors who relished their roles as tormentors marched their blindfolded charges into the gym building whose bottom floor was bathrooms, dressing rooms, and an alleged swimming pool. Once into the bathroom area, the unhappy few whom fate had caused to fall into the hands of the 12th graders from Hades had to kneel and embrace close-range toilet bowls brimming with Limburger cheese. I was told the cheese smelled very little like cheese. The whole initiation ritual, which had begun on Monday morning, ended at noon on Friday with some brief ceremony on the playing field, wel welcoming us into the brotherhood. It's fair to say that some of us freshmen felt more brotherly to the seniors than did others. In my ninth grade year, Catholic High School had a fantastic football team, though I'm not sure I really realized it at the time. The Rockets won 10 games and lost one. Those darn Papa Cats. <laughs> I was, like any other freshman, wowed by the idea that my high school team played football games at War Memorial Stadium. I mean, that was just wonderful. And then to have such a wonderful team made it a really fun year. I'd like to read to you a little bit about that team, which had, by the way, just recently, 50th anniversary. The players I was most aware of at the time had the glamour positions. Ronnie Pyle was the scat back touchdown maker. Buddy Cagle was a rangy end who caught most of the passes thrown by Tom Barre, the quarterback who led the team. Ronnie Pye once had the distinction of needing 12 guys to tackle him. In one game where he had already run one punt return back for a touchdown, he got loose on another and was streaking down the sidelines with nobody in sight to make the tackle and Buddy Cakel alongside the block for him. That's when the opponent's 12th man took over, a frustrated substitute who apparently couldn't bear the sight of Ronnie being goal bound again, jumped off the bench and onto the field, knocking him off his feet. <laughs> a bizarre sight, but one that had just been seen three years before in the Cotton Bowl. Both Pyle and Cagle knew once what violation of the rules had occurred, and they pointed to the illegal tackle. Remember that as clear as ever yesterday, just pointing at him like, look at this guy. <laughs> That's when the referee threw up his hands and signaled a touchdown. It was a, a great, great team. I have a little note in here about the aforementioned Roger Armbrust, about the two of us having the opportunity to play a little b-ball, 
which was our passion, with one of the Catholic high priests of that time. My basketball brother was Roger Armbrust. Friends, since I moved to Little Rock in 51, we sent, spent huge chunk chunks of time playing ball. If we had given half that time to practicing the piano or cello, we had made it to Carnegie Hall. We went to CHS one winter Saturday to play in the gym, inhospitably small and cold though it might have been. And who should show up to play? Father John Doyle. We hadn't tested his mettle on the court prior to that morning, and we and some others were engaged in a game of three-on-three three as we began to see him reveal his repertoire of Philadelphia-style round ball. I'm guessing that at the time he was taking on us 15-year-olds, he must have been in his mid-30s. He showed us quickly that he knew his way around the hardwood, especially when it came to making adroit passes to his teammates for an easy score. Roger was on his side, and as he was the recipient of one of Father Doyle's fancy assists, he couldn't contain his enthusiasm for the excellent pass. Attaboy, uh, Father. <laughs> Father Doyle taught us biology. He was the kind of guy who appreciated my not-so-intellectual humor, such as on the day when we were talking about the flower, and he said, Moran, what's the answer? And I said, Father Doyle, what was the question? <laughs> you might remember, some of you don't know, enough to remember a big old jar full of formaldehyde with various kinds of specimens to be dissected. Father Doyle had us doing that. One day we were dissecting a muscle, and uh, that is to say a uh, hard shell muscle, and one of the budding scientists cried out loudly, Father Doyle, I found the pearl. Father Doyle went rushing back to the lad's desk and soon was exulting for all to hear about the discovery. One or two skeptical students were saying something about muscles not producing pearls, but we didn't pay any attention to them. Then the ecstatic discoverer noticed that his pearl had tiny holes in each end, as if it had been recently liberated from a dime store necklace. <laughs> Father Doyle had worked his sleight of hand, though he never openly took credit for depositing the gem. The joker had struck. We later were told that ours wasn't the first class to have a muscle surrender of pearl. <clears throat> I see in the back, I think, of Catholic High Latin. Charlie Cook, is that you? Did, uh, when you were a sophomore, did anybody discover a pearl that you recall? Sure did. Absolutely. <laughs> He would look at it while we were t 
telling everybody else about the new big news. I had a classmate whose name was Dutch O'Neill, and Dutch was picked to speak about his current event. I remember Dutch standing before us, hands behind his back, sort of shifting from one foot to the other, but with a big smile on his face, it was obvious that he had this thing down cold, so he was ready to go. So here's what he said. Yesterday, blonde bombshell movie star Jane Mansfield married Hungarian weightlifter Mickey Hargitay in a ceremony. It's at that point that Coach Malham said, Son, sit down. <laughs> we don't want to hear about that. And I thought, heck, I want to hear about that. <laughs> but anyway, Dutch sadly went to his place. And uh, it's likely that we all made mental notes to consider more carefully the content of our future current events reports. Coach Downey. Part one, then, of the book is my Catholic High experience. The second part has to do with teachers and staff. There isn't anybody probably who taught a Catholic High for a year or two who wasn't the victim of some kind of student prank. One of the most common ones took place on the opening day when teachers would send around a sheet of paper and students would sign. This is in pre computer days, and students had to sign a sheet of paper to let us know that they were in their classes. So diligent among us would go home that night and make up a list and roll for the class, and then the next day we would be calling out nonsense names like Chuck Roast, <laughs> Chuck, where are you Chuck, Ben Dover, <laughs> Ben where are you? One of the best pranks that I ever heard of happened to a priest named Father Reuben Groff. The old Catholic High had a big study hall that had attached to it a good-sized porch. And if one were in the study hall and the door were closed to the porch, you couldn't tell if anybody was out there or not. So Father Groff, I guess probably in his rookie year, maybe in his first day, he had to leave the study hall for some unknown reason. Uh, I said one day, as the story goes, Father Groff had to leave the study hall for more than a minute or two. How the fellows assigned to the hall knew that he would be gone that long is included in the long list which is entitled, The Things Students Know That Teachers Don't Know That They Know. <laughs> so while Father Groff was gone, the boys ex exited probably 50 of them all onto the porch and closed the door behind them. On his return, Father Groff found the study hall empty. Anyone putting himself or herself in the shoes of this rookie teacher can imagine the combination of wonderment and fear that must have swept over him. So Father Groff did what anyone would do. He went looking for the AWOL 75 or 55. Not quickly finding them, he must have swallowed hard before he saw help. The tale states that Father Tribu was called in and they both returned to the study hall, now repopulated with all 75 <laughs> of his original students. No doubt an explanation about the porch soon followed. There are a number of Catholic High boys in the room who will distinctly remember Father Bernard de Bozier. Father de Bozier was a very uh, outgoing character with a booming voice. And uh, he was capable of what seemed like volcanic outrage when students didn't do the right thing. He was known for statements such as, Boy, I'm going to tear off that head of yours and roll it down the hall like a bowling ball. <laughs> the question of whether or not students feared him, in my mind, is answered, I don't think so. I think we all knew that he was just sort of, uh, it was Father de Bozier's histrionics in, in place. Now, he was a mellifluous speaker. 
He was, according to one of his very best priest friends, never one to make up a sermon in advance. He would just read the gospel today and stand up and preach. And he could go on as long as you could listen, maybe even longer. In any case, he was a, a devotee of the proper use of the English language. I have a story about how one of his students made an especially egregious error. And Father DeBosier, with his dramatic uh, way, said, Boy, you're fracturing the king's English. One can only guess at the dismay that Father DeBosier must have felt in terms of how far he had to go to succeed with that particular student after hearing the boy's response. I don't care about no king. <laughs> Many of our staff members have been at Catholic High for decades. Tonight, for example, in our audience is Mrs. Barbara Pierce, who has done the increasingly more complicated work of keeping track of all the money at Catholic High. Another two-decade veteran about whom I wrote was Mrs. Woody Butler, who was the head of Catholic High's cafeteria for 20 years. Even though she was the mother of a basketball uh, teammate of mine, I eventually grew to be able to call her Catherine. And uh, she was an excellent cook of food in large amounts. Uh, Steve Wells, another faculty member, one day was on duty in the lunchroom when a disgruntled student approached him. He said, Mr. Wells, where do I go to get my money back? Steve said, well, what's the problem? And the boy showed him a hair that was on his piece of meatloaf. Steve knew Mrs. Butler probably wouldn't take kindly to an indignant student commenting negatively about the food, but he figured out the boy had to find out this for himself. So he directed him to where Mrs. Butler was working in the kitchen. Steve returned to his post. Steve soon heard raised voices coming from the kitchen. He decided he'd better investigate. Mrs. Butler had every cafeteria employee lined up in front of the complainant. Each employee was not only wearing an all-encompassing hairnet, but each was a brunette, as was Mrs. Butler. As she held up the long blonde hair that had sparked the boy's outrage, she demanded of him, so tell me, where did this hair come from? <clears throat> so the befuddled student's reply is not recorded, though were I in his situation, I'm sure abject groveling would have ensued. When I was on my way to Catherine Butler's Rosary after she died. I don't know why it occurred to me to wonder how many meals must she have served in 20 years at Catholic High. So I did the arithmetic. 20 years of lunch times 180 days of school is 3,600 days. If one inserts a conservative estimate of 400 boys a day eating lunch, it was very popular. Believe me, we didn't have vending machines and lunch was the deal. You get a million four hundred thousand meals that this woman presided over. And it was common at the end of a lunch period when the boys had particularly liked her frito pie or any other food that she served, they would holler out to her, Good lunch, Ma, which is what they call her. So she was one of our scholars as well. <clears throat> Anybody got a question so far? I feel it's only fair to give you an opportunity. Question or comment, correction. Jump right in here. Until the second and last year that I taught, when I got to the end of Ode on a Grecian Urn, and there's more than one person in here who will vouch for this story, I said, now we can talk about anything in this poem except the last two lines. I really don't know what they mean, so hold your questions and we'll talk about that when we get there. So the last lines say, beauty is truth, 
truth, beauty, that's all you know on earth and all you need to know. And I said, boy, I have mulled this over for 25 years. I, and the longer I think of it, you know, the less I have any really good idea of what this means. Anybody want to take a crack at it? Boy, everybody, you know, they say, well, it means this. And then I kept saying, you might be right. You might be right. I promise I won't ask you about this on the test, but you might be right. And I told them, I said, you know, 40 years ago, I remember Father Tribune telling a class of us seniors about one of his juniors, and he said, do you boys all know so-and-so? We said, oh, yeah, we know that knucklehead. He said, last period, he just explained something to me in a poem that apparently I have been misunderstanding for decades. And we said, he did? He said, yeah. So I was used to tell my students, I said, you know, one of you might, you know, just have the key to this. So up went another hand. His name is Harrison Hatfield. I wrote his name down in my book. Because suddenly he had said to me, Mr. Rand, I think these two lines mean this. Blah, 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 blah. I said, say that again. Blah, 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 blah. I said, I think you're right. I said, that's the first answer I've heard in umpteen years that sounds right to me, and I congratulate you. So you never know when a hand in the air, you know, is going to deliver something really valuable rather than, you know, some comment like, your zipper's open, Mr. Moran, or something like that. <laughs> the third part of the book is about the boys. And the unpredictable nature of any given day's class was the thing that always made it interesting to go into a classroom. You could teach the same poem to two different classes of juniors or seniors and have a completely different class. Sometimes it's just going like this and other times, you know, it's like going through sand on your knees. So it was an unpredictable but always interesting day. One of the very first moments that I had in terms of this unpredictability was in my first year, I was teaching a poem called The Ballad of the Oysterman. And there are some fellows here who will recall their classmate, Lewin Williams, being the person I asked after we'd gotten all through talking about the poem and had all kinds of exciting stuff going on in it, a young lover who swam a river to get to his girlfriend and so on. And I, for whatever reason, I said, Lewin, what did you think? Did you like that poem? I didn't like that poem at all. I said, well, the Battle of the Oysters, what's wrong with that? He said, I don't like oysters. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of my first clear moment of thinking, well, you better try to expect the unexpected. One unexpected thing that happened to me just a couple of years ago was, as you may know, Catholic Kai doesn't have a lot of air conditioning. Father Tribe was always defending this. I thought his most uh, outrageous defense was he put up a sign that was supposedly signed by God, and it said, you think it's hot here? <laughs> But there are old boys here in the room, I know, who are probably unhappy to hear that sometime we started letting boys wear shorts when the temperature hit 90. What's wrong with those sissies? I'm saying, man, these kids have grown up every day of their lives in the summertime, so they're going to they're going to drop dead. The top four at Tavakai had th some teachers brought thermometers, and it hit 105 up there a couple of times when teaching was going on, supposedly, and learning. At any rate, I had my window open, and in flew a bee, as if coming right up this row. Some of the, one of the boys in the class was reading a poem to the rest of the students, and I saw this bee, and he was coming right at me. I thought, Lord, he's coming right at me. As he approached, I got my book up. One kid, like in the second seat of this row, happened to see the bee, the bee go by. But I saw his eyes jump up. And as the bee came right at me, I took my book and I went, 
bam, and I got it in midair, right at my feet, and I went bam. That's when he gave me the best compliment I ever got in 40 years. Dude. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it's just a letter, one way or the other, that isn't quite the right place. For example, I had a student who was bragging about a Jeep that he owned, and instead of an I, he put an E when he was bragging about his Jeep having an 800-pound winch, W-E-S-E, <laughs> on the front bone. Word processing computer has improved student writing and measure. It really has. Just, you know, the reading of it is so much easier. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all know that there are various kinds of errors that your spell checker or your grammar checker don't know. This is what explains the spell checker phenomenon, explains a sentence that I got that just absolutely floored me until I finally figured out that, oh, that's the spell checker at work. Kim was writing me an essay about his ideal college, and it was on a lake that was glistening. Well, however he mangled glistening, his spell checker jumped to the rescue, and the first word that it suggested was the one he assumed was the right one. So he put it in there. And that's why I read, the lake was glycerin. <laughs> it doesn't sound too pleasant. One of the things about being at Catholic High was that, as I said, the boys sometimes did things that were unexpected. For example, one year, we heard about a famine in Africa, and I was familiar with a, an aid group called Oxfam, and I asked Father Tribe if we could take up a collection one day, and he said, sure. So I went on the closed circuit TV, like on a Tuesday, and I said, guys, on Friday, we're going to take up a collection. And I told them what I told Father Tribe, and he said to me, how much do you think we can raise? I said, I think we can raise $3,000. He said, you're crazy. That's practically $5 a kid. I said, well, I, so I went on TV, and I said to him, I said, I told Father Tribe that on Friday, you're going to bring in 3000 bucks. He told me I was nuts. And the longer I thought about it, of course, I'm thinking, Freshmen and sophomores don't have any money, you know, it's up to the juniors and seniors and so on. So anyway, on that day, when the ROTC department pitched in 200 bucks, we did hit $3,000. And it was one of the days that I was proudest to be associated with Catholic High. Another had to do with a football game that Catholic High lost think by the score, I don't even want to say this out loud, it was like 12 touchdown, touchdowns to one touchdown or something like that. We went to North Little Rock not so many years ago, and we ended up on the losing, on the losing end of a score that would have taken 11 touchdowns to undo. <laughs> the defeat was total, crushing, humiliating to some. A week or so after the game, a letter about the game appeared in the local paper. The writer mentioned that he had seen the game as a casual observer rather than as a partisan. He noted the lopsided score and then ended the letter with nothing but praise for Catholic High. The team, he said, never quit, nor did the fans. He said that the fourth quarter support for and the effort by the team matched that of the first period. I think that game deserves to be remembered for its players and fans who exhibited the never say die spirit that one wants to think that our athletic program promotes as an ultimate value. 
So win or lose, go Rockets. The last part of the book deals with my 30 plus years of being employed at Cavatai as a result of a telephone call from Father George Tribe, who called me in the summer when I was completing, completing my work in graduate school and he said, you want a job? He said, I understand you're taking English up there in Fayetteville. I said, I am. I said, yeah, I want a job. So for something less than $600 a month for nine months, I got my first job at Catholic High. Uh, my relationship with Father Tribe over the years, I would have to say, was generally excellent. He thought my taste in literature was pretty stinky. There was a book that Father Tribe loved that every Catholic High boy in here has read. Um, God, does the name escape me at the moment? The boy falls out of the tree. <laughs> Thank you, Catholic High Boys. <laughs> I was just pretending to forget that. <laughs> I told Father Trevor, I said, this is the worst written book. I said, now I never tell the students that because I know they love this book, but it's just atrocious. He said, what's wrong with I had all kinds of stuff underlined, and I'd read this and that and the other, and he said, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> when he was in a coma at UAMS, I decided one night to take the book and read it to him. Of course, we had no idea whether he could hear anything or not. So I said to him, well, I'm doing this under protest, but I'm going to read some of a separate piece to you. So I was reading a page or two or three about all that I could take. And at that point, I said, well, I think you've heard enough. And it just seemed to me that he sort of uh, gripped my hand tighter than before. And I thought, oh, for Pete's sakes, maybe he can. So I read a few more pages to him. Steve Wells had the same experience when he went to visit Father Trivey. Father Trivey said, you do not honor Dr. Martin Luther King by letting 19 million kids sleep late and do nothing all day. We're going to school on Martin Luther King's birthday in honor of this man, who at a birthday party that his employees held for him, cut the cake, had a bite, said, okay, everybody, back to work. So Steve was at Catholic High and said to Father Tribune, well, it's Martin Luther King's birthday, and Catholic High is the only school in session. And he also got the squeeze on the hand. <laughs> I am told, and this is a story that isn't in the book, that a similar experience was that of Bill Clinton's, who visited Father Tribune and also got something of a response like that. So, Father Tribune was, of course, capable of extremely stern and demanding kinds of standards for Catholic High, and yet at the same time, he had a terrific sense of humor. When he was talking to us one year before school started, he wanted to tell us about a student who had a certain problem. And it was a rather unusual and unpleasant kind of problem. And Father Tribe said, I'm going to tell you teachers who have him what his name is. And Father Raymond Rossi, himself a legend in Catholic High, said, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I'm going to have this kid for two years of Latin, and I don't want to know. And Father Tribe said, fine, go out of the room. Off and on for those two years, Father Tribe would give Father Rossi said, Ray, I think you need to know who that boy is. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. On the last day that this boy was to be in Father Rossi's class, he approached Father Tribu with a piece of paper that had been folded and stapled. Father Rossi opened it up, a note from Father Tribu. It says, Ray, he's the one. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? 
One last little thing <clears throat> before I come to a close. When Father Tribune died and we went to the cemetery, we were surprised and then thrilled to see that for all eternity he decided to be buried not in the ring of priests, not that he wouldn't have appreciated being with his brother priests, but that he decided to be buried next to one of my great friends at Catholic High, a teacher named Richard Altoff. And so I think in some way this tells you about his connection to the school, that this fine young teacher who had died so early was the man he chose to reside next to for all eternity. And I have been thrilled to be able, when I go to Calvary, and say hey to the two of them, to be able to do it without very many steps at all. <laughs> I thank you very much for coming tonight. If you are of a mind to get a copy of Proudly We Speak Your Name, the, uh, through the good offices of Wordsworth Books, we are having some for sale tonight. And I'll give this mic back to you. Thank you very much for coming. This is a person it, I know. It, it's I, a comment. Oh. I have a friend who, uh, whose son you, you taught, and you encouraged him to read by bringing comic books and magazines into the class, and she thanks you all the time because really? you instilled in her son the desire to read. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, here's a guy. Here's one of my qualified members. Two brief comments, Mike and I go back many years. I taught at Catholic High for seven years. Um, I was one of those new teachers once upon a time, and instead of having the young men write their names down, I said, your name, your name, your name. And I got Tony Curtis, <laughs> Jeff Davis, Chris Keeper. I said, oh, now, I wasn't born yesterday. Every one of those was a bona fide name. <laughs> And they just happen to come right in succession. Uh, this probably couldn't be put in the book, but uh, I remember being in one of the funeral home cars coming back from Father Bozier's funeral. Father Bozier loved his cigarette, he loved his coffee, he loved good food, and he loved to shop. And so Father Tribune and I and Monsignor Thomas Father Rossi were in this car, and Father Thomas said, you know, I can just see Father Rosier in heaven. He can smoke as much as he wants, he can eat as much as he wants, he can shop as much as he wants. Wait a minute, he did all that here. <laughs> Eric Francis, class of 86. Uh, I also have a comment, not a question. First day of my freshman year, we trooped at the Latin class. And you wanted to put us at ease because most of us had no clue what Latin was going to be like. And you informed us, boys, everyone is ignorant and there's nothing wrong with this. And you turned and thrust your arm out to me and said, you, sir, there used to be an African nation named Upper Volta. It no longer exists. What was its capital? And I just kind of gulped like a fish for a while. And you said, see, ignorance. <laughs> Now, if I may, before my another lifelong friend gets a crack at me, <clears throat> I did then say to Eric, ask me what your middle name is. And you did. And I said, I don't know. And I said, so what does that make me? And you said, thank you. <laughs> uh, Mike, I've known you a long time, and I don't think I ever asked you this question, and that is, why in God's name would you stay 40 years teaching a bunch of kids? <laughs> Well, as I said, it might be due to lack of imagination or inertia or any better offer. I did one time seriously read a couple of books about teaching in college, and I thought, as undiplomatic as I am, I will never make it in the world of college teaching that involves a good bit of, uh, of uh, politics. So I knew that that was not the course for me. Um, 
I think it was the, the fact that there were so many uh, unexpected and charming things, believe it or not, that come along with uh, dealing with adolescents. I don't think I could have taught junior high kids. I'm sure I don't have the talent to teach grade school children. I think we all know that the way teaching the most important teachers are in the first, second, and third grade, and then as we go up, the rest of us become less and less important. But uh, that was, uh, it was just the kind of thing that when a student said to me, Mr. Moran, was it really Sherlock Holmes? And I said, no. He said, why not? <laughs> Thanks to everybody.